Hello, this is Natasha, and His Royal Highness Prince Bertie the Frog has asked me to tell you the story of Ricky Ticky Tavi from the Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. Now, Rudyard Kipling wrote some very famous stories about the boy who was brought up in the Indian jungle by a kind family of wolves. But not all the stories in the Jungle Books were about that little man cub. Bertie tells me that some of the best stories are about the other animals, and this one is about a little boy who made friends with a mongoose, which is a very special animal that fights snakes. It's called Ricky Ticky Tavi. This is the story of the Great War that Ricky Ticky Tavi fought single-handed through the bathrooms of the big bungalow at Sagauli Cantonment. Darzi, the tailor bird, helped him, and Chachundra, the muskrat, who never comes out into the middle of the floor but always creeps round by the wall, gave him advice. But Ricky Ticky did the real fighting. He was a mongoose, rather like a little cat in his fur and his tail, but quite like a weasel in his head and his habits. His eyes at the end of his restless nose were pink. He could scratch himself anywhere he pleased with any leg, front or back, that he chose to use. He could fluff up his tail till it looked like a bottle brush. And his war cry, as he scuttled through the long grass, was "Rick tick ticky ticky tick." One day, a high summer flood washed him out of the burrow where he lived with his father and mother, and carried him, kicking and clucking down a roadside ditch. He found a little wisp of grass floating there, and clung to it till he lost his senses. When he revived, he was lying in the hot sun on the middle of a garden path, very draggled indeed, and a small boy was saying, "He is a dead mongoose. I think we should have a funeral." "No," said his mother. "Let's take him in and dry him. Perhaps he isn't really dead." They took him into the house, and a big man picked him up between his finger and thumb and said, "He was not dead, but half choked." So they wrapped him in cotton wool and warmed him over a little fire, and he opened his eyes and sneezed. "Now," said the big man, he was an Englishman who had just moved into the bungalow. "Don't frighten him, and we'll see what he'll do." It is the hardest thing in the world to frighten a mongoose because he is eaten up from nose to tail with curiosity. The motto of all the mongoose family is, "Run and find out," and Ricky Ticky was a true mongoose. He looked at the cotton wool, and decided that it was not good to eat. Ran all round the table, sat up, and put his fur in order. Scratched himself, and jumped up on the small boy's shoulder. Don't be frightened, Teddy," said his father. "That's his way of making friends." Ouch! He's tickling under my chin," said Teddy. Ricky Ticky looked down between the boy's collar and neck, snuffed at his ear, and climbed down to the floor where he sat rubbing his nose. Good gracious," said Teddy's mother, "and that's a wild creature. I suppose he's so tame because we've been kind to him. All mongooses are like that," said her husband. "If Teddy doesn't pick him up by the tail or try to put him in a cage, he'll run in and out of the house all day long. Let's give him something to eat." They gave him a little piece of raw meat. Ricky Ticky liked it immensely, and when it was finished, he went out into the veranda and sat in the sunshine and fluffed up his fur to make it dry to the roots. Then he felt better. There are more things to find out about in this house, he said to himself, than all my family could find out in all their lives. 
I shall certainly stay and find out. He spent all that day roaming over the house. He nearly drowned himself in the bathtubs and put his nose into the ink on a writing table and burned it on the end of the big man's cigar, for he climbed up in the big man's lap to see how writing was done. At nightfall, he ran into Teddy's nursery to watch how kerosene lamps were lighted. And when Teddy went to bed, Ricky Ticky climbed up too. But he was a restless companion, because he had to get up and attend to every noise all through the night and find out what had made it. Teddy's mother and father came in, last thing at night, to look at their little boy. And Ricky Ticky was awake on the pillow. I don't like that, said Teddy's mother. He may bite the child. He'll do no such thing, said the father. Teddy's safer with that little beast than if he had a bloodhound to watch him. If a snake came into the nursery now... But Teddy's mother would not think of anything so awful. Early in the morning, Ricky Ticky came to early breakfast in the veranda riding on Teddy's shoulder, and they gave him a banana and some boiled egg. He sat on all their laps, one after the other, because every well-brought-up mongoose always hopes to be a house mongoose some day and have rooms to run about in. Then Ricky Ticky went out into the garden to see what was to be seen. It was a large garden, only half cultivated with bushes as big as summer houses, of martial kneel roses, lime and orange trees, clumps of bamboos and thickets of high grass. Ricky Ticky licked his lips. This is a splendid hunting ground, he said, and his tail grew bottle brushy at the thought of it and he scuttled up and down the garden, sniffing here and there, till he heard very sorrowful voices in a thorn bush. It was Darzi, the tailor bird, and his wife. They had made a beautiful nest by pulling two big leaves together, by stitching them up the edges with fibres, and they had filled the hollow with cotton and downy fluff. The nest swayed to and fro as they sat on the rim and cried. What is the matter? asked Ricky Ticky. We are very miserable, said Darzee. One of our babies fell out of the nest yesterday and Nag ate him. Hmm, said Ricky Ticky. That is very sad. But I am a stranger here. Who is Nag? Darzi and his wife only cowered down in the nest without answering. For from the thick grass at the foot of the bush, there came a low hiss. A horrid cold sound that made Ricky Ticky jump back to two clear feet. Then inch by inch out of the grass rose up the head and spread hood of Nag, the big black cobra. And he was five feet long from tongue to tail. When he had lifted one third of himself clear of the ground, he stayed balancing to and fro, exactly as a dandelion tuff balances in the wind. And he looked at Ricky Ticky with the wicked snake's eyes that never changed their expression, whatever the snake might be thinking of. I am Nag. The great god Brahm put his mark upon all our people when the first cobra spread his hood to keep the sun off Brahm as he slept. Look! And be afraid. He spread out his hood more than ever. And Ricky Ticky saw the spectacle mark on the back of it that looks exactly like the eye part of a hook and eye fastening. He was afraid for the minute. But it is impossible for a mongoose to stay frightened for any length of time. 
and though Ricky Ticky had never met a live cobra before, his mother had fed him on dead ones, and he knew that all a grown mongoose's business in life was to fight and eat snakes. Nag knew that too, and at the bottom of his cold heart he was afraid. Well, said Ricky Ticky, and his tail began to fluff up again. Marks or no marks, do you think it is right to eat fledglings out of a nest? Nag was thinking to himself and watching the least little movement in the grass behind Ricky Ticky. He knew that mongooses in the garden meant death sooner or later for him and his family, but he wanted to get Ricky Ticky off his guard. So he dropped his head a little and put it on one side. Let us talk, he said. You eat eggs. Why should not I eat birds? Behind you! Look behind you! sang Darzi. Ricky Ticky knew better than to waste time in staring. He jumped up in the air as high as he could go, and just under him whizzed the head of Nagina, Nag's wicked wife. She had crept up behind him as he was talking to make an end of him. He heard her savage hiss as the stroke missed. He came down almost across her back, and if he had been an old mongoose, he would have known that then was the time to break her back with one bite. But he was afraid of the terrible lashing return stroke of the cobra. He bit, indeed, but did not bite long enough and he jumped clear of the whisking tail, leaving the gyna torn and angry. Wicked, wicked, Darzy, said Nag, lashing up as high as he could reach towards the nest in the thorn bush. But Darzy had built it out of reach of snakes, and it only swayed to and fro. Ricky Ticky felt his eyes growing red and hot. When a mongoose's eyes grow red, he is angry. And he sat back on his tail and hind legs like a little kangaroo and looked all around him and chattered with rage. But Nag and Nagina had disappeared into the grass. When a snake misses its stroke, it never says anything or gives any sign of what it means to do next. Ricky Ticky did not care to follow them for he did not feel sure that he could manage two snakes at once. So he trotted off to the gravel path near the house and sat down to think. It was a serious matter for him. If you read the old books of natural history, you will find that they say that when the mongoose fights the snake and happens to get bitten, he runs off and eats some herb that cures him. That is not true. The victory is only a matter of quickness of eye and quickness of foot. Snakes blow against mongooses jump. And as no eye can follow the motion of a snake's head when it strikes, this makes things much more wonderful than any magic herb. Ricky Ticky knew he was a young mongoose and it made him all the more pleased to think that he had managed to escape a blow from behind. It gave him confidence in himself. And when Teddy came running down the path, Ricky Ticky was ready to be petted. But just as Teddy was stooping, something wriggled a little in the dust, and a tiny voice said, Be careful. I am death. It was Kurate, the dusty brown snakeling that lies for choice on the dusty earth, and his bite is as dangerous as the cobra's. But he is so small that nobody thinks of him, and so he does the more harm to people. Ricky Ticky's eyes grew red again, 
and he danced up to Crate with a peculiar rocking, swaying motion that he had inherited from his family. It looks very funny, but it is so perfectly balanced a gait that you can fly off from it at any angle you please, and in dealing with snakes, this is an advantage. If Ricky Ticky had only known, he was doing a much more dangerous thing than fighting Nag, for Crate is so small and can turn so quickly that unless Ricky bit him close to the back of the head, he would get the return stroke in his eye or his lip. But Ricky did not know. His eyes were all red and he rocked back and forth, looking for a good place to hold. Crate struck out. Ricky jumped sideways and tried to run in. But the wicked little dusty grey head lashed with a fraction of his shoulder and he had to jump over the body and the head following his heels close. Teddy shouted to the house, Oh, look here! Our mongoose is killing a snake! And Ricky Ticky heard a scream from Teddy's mother. His father ran out with a stick. But by the time he came up, Crate had lunged out once too far, and Ricky Ticky had sprung, jumped on the snake's back, dropped his head far between his forelegs, bitten as high up the back as he could get hold of, and rolled away. That bite paralysed Crate, and Ricky Ticky was just going to eat him up from the tail after the custom of his family at dinner. When he remembered, that a full meal makes a slow mongoose. And if he wanted all his strength and quickness ready, he must keep himself thin. He went away for a dust bath under the castor oil bushes, while Teddy's father beat the dead crate. What is the use of that? thought Ricky Ticky. I have settled it all. And then Teddy's mother picked him up from the dust and hugged him, crying that he had saved Teddy from death. And Teddy's father said that he was a providence, and Teddy looked on with big, scared eyes. Ricky Ticky was rather amused at all the fuss, which, of course, he did not understand. Teddy's mother might just as well have petted Teddy for playing in the dust. Ricky was thoroughly enjoying himself. That night at dinner, walking to and fro among the wine glasses on the table, he might have stuffed himself three times over with nice things. But he remembered Nag and Nagina, and though it was very pleasant to be patted and petted by Teddy's mother and to sit on Teddy's shoulder, his eyes would get red from time to time and he would go off into his long war cry of Rick tick ticky ticky tick Teddy carried him off to bed and insisted on Ricky Ticky sleeping under his chin. Ricky Ticky was too well bred to bite or scratch. But as soon as Teddy was asleep, he went off for his nightly walk around the house, and in the dark he ran up against Chachundra, the muskrat creeping around by the wall. Chachundra is a broken-hearted little beast. He whimpers and creeps all the night, trying to make up his mind to run into the middle of the room, but he never gets there. Don't kill me, said Chachundra, almost weeping. Ricky Ticky, don't kill me. Do you think a snake killer kills muskrats? said Ricky Ticky scornfully. Those who kill snakes get killed by snakes, said Chachundra, more sorrowfully than ever. And how am I to be sure that Nag won't mistake me for you some dark night? There's not the least danger, said Ricky Ticky, but Nag is in the garden and I know you don't go there. My cousin Chua, the rat, told me, said Chachundra, and then he stopped. 
told you what. Whoosh, nag is everywhere, Ricky Dicky. You should have talked to Chua in the garden. I didn't, so you must tell me. Quick, Chachundra, or I'll bite you. Chachundra sat down and cried till the tears rolled off his whiskers. I am a very poor man, he sobbed. I never had spirit enough to run into the middle of the room. Hush, I mustn't tell you anything. Can't you hear? Ricky Ticky. Ricky Ticky listened. The house was as still as still. But he thought he could just catch the faintest scratch scratch in the world. A noise as faint as that of a wasp walking on a window pane. The dry scratch of a snake's scales on brickwork. That's nag on a gyna, he said to himself. And he is crawling into the bathroom sluice. You're right, Jajundra. I should have talked to Chua. He stole off to Teddy's bathroom. But there was nothing there. And then to Teddy's mother's bathroom. At the bottom of the smooth plaster wall, there was a brick pulled out to make a sluice for the bath water. And as Ricky Ticky stole in by the masonry curb where the bath is put, he heard Nag and Nagina whispering together outside in the moonlight. When the house is emptied of people, said Nagina to her husband, he will have to go away. And then the garden will be our own again. Go in quietly and remember that the big man who killed Karet is the first one to bite. Then come out and tell me and we will hunt for Ricky Ticky together. But are you sure that there is anything to be gained by killing the people? said Nag. Everything. When there were no people in the bungalow, did we have any mongoose in the garden? So long as the bungalow is empty, we are king and queen of the garden. And remember that as soon as our eggs in the melon bed hatch, as they may tomorrow, our children will need room and quiet. I had not thought of that, said Nag. I will go. There is no need that we should hunt for Ricky Ticky afterward. I will kill the big man and his wife and the child if I can and come away quietly. Then the bungalow will be empty and Ricky Ticky will go. Ricky Ticky tingled all over with rage and hatred at this. And then Nag's head came through the sluice and his five feet of cold body followed it. Angry as he was, Ricky Ticky was very frightened as he saw the size of the big cobra. Nag coiled himself up, raised his head and looked into the bathroom in the dark and Ricky Ticky could see his eyes glitter. Now, if I kill him here, Nagaina will know, and if I fight him on the open floor, the odds are in his favour. What am I to do? said Ricky Ticky Tarvi. Nag waved to and fro, and then Ricky Ticky heard him drinking from the biggest water jar that was used to fill the bath. That is good, said the snake. And that's the end of the first part of Ricky Ticky Tavi. Oh, it's terribly scary and exciting all at the same time. I can't wait to find out what happens next. But we'll have to wait till next time at storynori.com. So until then, from me, Natasha. Bye-bye.